People keep saying like people aren't reading anymore. People don't have attention spans anymore. It's all going to be TikTok, not books. And I'm like, well, I guess I got to give all this money back. I'm making off of books, you know. In this episode, I talked to Tim Grawl, who is legitimately one of the best book marketers in the world. Look, my goal is to publish a book that sells for decades. Every book I publish is two and a half times more likely than the typical book from traditional publishing to be successful. Back when he had clients in the book marketing world, he had had five of them on the New York Times bestseller list at the exact same time. I'll give a book to somebody if I think they'll read it because I don't need that sale. I need the sale of the next five people they tell. Tim has a very effective flywheel for his story grid businesses. Hundreds of books that will sell for decades. Our goal is that our grandkids college is paid for by the books we publish. So we are putting all of our effort on helping writers produce the best books possible. Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Nathan. So when you and I are hanging out in Nashville, Boise, wherever, Atlanta, wherever we find ourselves, you know, at a mastermind or just over dinner, we're always talking about books and uh, specifically like just the reach of books overall. And you were quoting some stats to me the other day. I think we severely underestimate the size of the book industry and what's going on there. Because like a book is not an expensive product. And so there's not really um, like the flashy business built around a book, but share some of the stats that you were talking to, you know, sharing yeah, uh, yeah. when we were talking the other day about just the size of the book industry compared to some of these flashier industries that, uh, you know, we think about more often. Yeah. It's, it's not just the flat, it's the flash all around. Like there's no, like, you don't look forward to the award ceremony every year for books, right? <laughs> That doesn't. Yeah, what even would that be? There's yeah. not um, the Oscars there, is books. It doesn't really. Yeah, either. I didn't see any like you know Barbenheim, Barbenheimer, or whatever you know news articles about the release of the newest book. But what people don't understand is that um, if you look at like the music industry, I went back and looked up some stats. So in 2022, the music industry was 42.5 billion dollars. If you look, uh, the global movie box office, global for uh, movie box office in 2023 was 29 billion. In 2023, book publishing made $98.6 billion. Wow. So people do not understand how big the book industry is. And it just kind of quietly makes tons and tons of money. And the reason why is because the, um, the products just last longer. So the example I like to use is like the Lord of the Rings was written. Fellowship of the Rings came out in 1954 and then the other two came out in 1955. And those still sell really well and make tons of money for the estate of J.R.R. Tolkien. OK, so how many movies and, and how much music, uh, how much money do those make from the 1950s now? I mean, it's like minuscule. Right. And so books last a long time and they tend to grow over time instead of diminish over time. And so um, you look at books, I mean, we both have examples, but um, this is what books can do. And so this is why it's such a bigger industry is because they tend to last a long time where like the new Barbie movie won't be making a lot of money 10 years from now, where a book that does really well this year or maybe even comes out slow but builds, it's still going to be making money for the author 10 years from now. I mean, there's so many examples here of, of different books. One that I think of a lot is our mutual friend, Josh Kaufman, with his mm -hmm. book, The Personal MBA. Uh, I think this summer it just hit a million copies sold, something like that. Or in well, the last it, hit that a, it hit that a while back now, but yeah. Okay. It, um, I think he's at I don't know. The last I heard was something like 1.2 million or something. Yeah. And that was published. Go ahead. Well, so what's in, here's what's interesting about that book. And this is, I use it as an example to talk people out of going after the New York times bestseller list is that book has never hit the New York times bestseller list, never hit the wall street journal bestseller list. I don't think it's ever hit any major bestseller list mm -hmm. and yet it sold well over a million copies. It still sells really strong and it's now been out like 12 years. And most of the books that you see pop onto the New York times list 
sell. There's so many books that hit the bestseller list that don't ever break a hundred thousand sales or even 50,000 sales. Uh, a lot of times books will like, they'll come out, they'll sell 10 or 15,000 copies and never sell another thousand copies the rest of the life. So this is the other thing too, is there's no like gold or platinum level um, reward for books. Uh, when yeah, they you don't have a record that sits on your wall. Of yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. With platinum. And so, um, and like the War of Art, we talk about a lot by Stephen Pressfield. It only sold a little over nine thousand copies the first year that it came out, but then every year since then, it's sold more copies than the year before. And so, it just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. And like this is the other thing is Steve has not touched that book since he wrote it. So there's no extra work involved besides a little bit through the publisher, which he doesn't have to do. And so um, he just gets checks. And so this is what's so fascinating about books to me is if you can get one, like my, I have one, um, your first 1000 copies I wrote in 2013, you know, it's not making me rich, but it brings in over a thousand bucks a month, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, it's this little just drip, drip, drip of money that, um, you know, I rewrote it in 2018. But other than that, I haven't touched that book since 2013. So it's like these things have a long shelf life uh, that most things don't. Well, when we were having dinner in Nashville, we were talking about your first 1000 copies. And, you know, if you're pursuing something as a, uh, like a side hustle, right? It'd be fairly natural to say, hey, I'm gonna take some money that I made and I'm gonna buy a property and long-term rent it. And if that, that makes me say between paying down my mortgage and the cash flow on top, let's say I make a thousand bucks a month, um, that'd be pretty good, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, steady yeah, stream. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, hey, this book that I wrote 10 years ago is doing more than that without having to take out a $300,000 loan or yeah. something. And so this is actually a better stream of revenue. Yeah, uh, there is just to make sure the metaphor holds like there is no big payoff at the end, right? So I right. can't like go and sell it at the end. But it is this idea of like, um, like uh, my partner, Sean Coyne and I run Story Grid, and we have a publishing house and we're going to continue to publish books. And our goal is that our grandkids college is paid for by the books we publish over the next 10 years. So if you have this long term view of the kind of wealth that can be built, a little bit at a time that a thousand bucks a month and you have 10 of those. Now you're talking about something that has a real impact on not. And this is a thing, not just your life, but think of like C.S. Lewis's estate and his mm -hmm. family and how they've been taken care of by stuff that he wrote a long time ago. So let's run through a couple more examples. Like I think of Ryan Holiday in this camp where, you know, he's putting out is it more than a book a year or is he right at a book a year? It's a lot. I think it depends on the year. Cause he's also starting to, um, I don't talk to him a lot, so I just watch what he does. So, um, I'm trying to remember, but I, he's also going into space where like, he's working with other authors. So like, uh, he'll, I think the daily stoic wasn't, uh, fully written by him. He had a yeah, it's him and his, his agent, they co-wrote it together. Cause okay. his agent, um, Steve, I believe is his name was like, Hey, you should write this book. And cause Steve had a firsthand insight into a couple of other like daily journal type books that had done really well. And Steve was telling Ryan, like, write the daily stoic. And Ryan's like, I don't know. Like, I'm just trying to get stoicism to be this thing that anyone cares about at all. And I'm trying to like hide it and package it inside of, you know, more approachable philosophy. And yeah. Steve kind of insisted it and predicted from the beginning. He said, this will be your best selling book. Yeah, and, and I think they, it is, isn't it? It is. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's well so, over, I think it's well over a million copies sold now. Yeah. So I mean, Ryan is so interesting to me. Um, in fact, like if there's one person I struggle with being jealous of in this industry, it's Ryan. <laughs> it's Ryan. Oh, um, just um he's just such a um and what I love, I mean, he's just such a workhorse and he he works really hard and he stays super focused on what he's interested in. Um, and there, I don't think anybody's working harder than him for his success. So I just, I just, I just think it's amazing what he does. Um, but yeah, it's like each book stacks. And then of course, then his speaker fees go up. 
uh, his email list grows, you know, he has his own bookstore now that he's selling books through, like it, it creates this whole ecosystem around, or as you might call it a flywheel mm -hmm. around like everything that he's doing. And so, but again, like all the way back to his very first book, um, which, Trust uh, me, I'm lying. yeah, the PR book, like that book still brings him in money. And so that's, I think the thing, like, I think we're so used to like doing a product launch or putting out this new thing or that new thing. And we don't think about like, there is this little industry over here that just kind of chugs along and makes almost a hundred billion dollars a year. And, um, books just keep on selling for a really long time. You know, I'm thinking about the difference between like the course industry and a lot of the areas that creators are in compared to books. And traditionally, a course has a lot of revenue up front. You know, people are making hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of dollars off of their course. Um, and then it has a, a fairly short shelf life, right? Like mm -hmm. not many people are running the same course and improving on it five years later, 10 years later. There's definitely people who are doing it. I think of uh, like Ramit Sethi with his Earn 1K course has been going for a long time. I think Marie Forleo is still doing B-School and having a big impact. Um, and you but get they to have the, to change it constantly, right? So like they continue to like adjust it for the market and what's changing and all of that, which is, I mean, wonderful. And obviously mm -hmm. they're doing really well with that. But like the book Ramit wrote, besides an update on the 10 year anniversary, yeah, he doesn't do anything with that thing. It just keeps selling, keeps selling. And again, keeps powering everything that he's doing. Right. And so it's just interesting. Like I imagine two different slopes, right. Of this, this spike and starting high with the course and then tapering off, mm -hmm. you know, basically to nothing, um, you know, over a long time horizon, I'm not talking one to two years. I'm talking 10 plus years. Whereas the book starting with this, you know, slow burn and growing from there, it's a different, it's a different model. Um, but it allows you to compound it, it rather than seeing the other side of the create the course creator jumping from thing to thing to thing yeah. and not the really other, having the compound returns. I mean, the other thing is that in the course, I mean, the course industry is relatively new and mm -hmm. everybody I'm talking to and including myself is seeing like it's getting harder. Prices are being pushed down less people like there's more competition because anybody can kind of jump in. And so the other thing I like about the book industry is it's been around for a really, really long time. And obviously, and, and this is the thing I love, I mean, you know, the book industry has been around hundreds of years. I've only been around for 42 years, but like, even like so many people keep calling for the death of the book. Oh, well, people don't have att attention spans anymore. And it's, it's all like, going to be TikTok, not books. And yeah, like, yeah. Oh, and I it's don't like, know about that. Yeah. Well, and even when people say that, I'm like, then why is the most popular podcast on the planet a three hour long rambling conversation? You know what I mean? So it just doesn't make any sense. And so people keep saying like people aren't reading anymore. And I'm like, well, I guess I got to give all this money back. I'm making off of books, you know? So, um, we've been and, thinking about Christmas this year. I mostly bought people books, yeah. right? And other people mostly bought me books because that's what, like, that's what I was interested in. <laughs> you yeah. know, we all get to a certain age. It's like, hey, just give me the book that you most enjoyed this year. And <laughs> that's all I want for Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I just think it's fascinating. And I mean, and a big part of what I've dedicated, many years now too is figuring out like okay what make what separates books out because books are just like mm -hmm. everything else where a small percentage of the books published make the most amount of money right so like atomic habits is making way more money than my little your first 1000 copies book which and they would both be in the like non-fiction how-to category and so i think it's super interesting looking at what it takes to create a book that will actually stand the test of time I want to dig into that, but you mentioned Atomic Habits. Uh, we're recording this in January 2024, and James just hit number one on all of Amazon for 2023 for the second time. <laughs> he did it. So the book was published in 2018, I believe, and the, or the end of yeah, 2018. 2018. Yeah. And then I think he like didn't hit any top 100 uh, in 2019. It was something like that. 2020, he was you know top 50, top 60. 2021 was, is, I think, was really high. 
I think no, 2022 was number one, 2023. Okay. I mean, the numbers wrong. 2021 was number one. 2022 was number five, I think. And 2023 was back at number one. Uh, in around the pandemic when it really started hitting big. Yeah. So, and I, I'm looking at it now. I've got it up on Amazon here and this, this is the thing. So I've been in the book industry now for, I don't know, like 13 years or something. I've literally never seen this before. He has 121,000 reviews and ratings on Amazon. Like that book has been around for five years. Insanely high. Like you, I, I don't know of another book. Uh, there's no way to like run a search on Amazon, but like you look up Harry Potter, it doesn't have a hundred thousand reviews. And so um, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> that, but that book, I almost don't like talking about it because it's so far, like such an outlier that like, it's almost like, I think a lot about the book, but I don't love talking about it because it's hard to use it as an example as something you could do because you can't, do what he did because it's also like the right time the right place um obviously he did an enormous amount of research but like it built off of this like growing wave of how to books around habits and he Mm -hmm. hit it at the right time and it's so well written and so well researched and he did such a great job building an audience before it came out he had this enormous audience before it even came out Uh, He got one of the best agents in New York. Like, I mean, it's just like everything hit for that book at the right time in the right place. And so it's this weird combination of a really well-written book, a really strong platform and just the right fucking time. And you can't like duplicate that. Um, But uh, I think the book, I just love, I've just loved watching the book since it came out because it's just been amazing to watch how successful it's been. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. But you were starting to talk about the difference between writing a book or actually the difference between writing a book and writing a great book. Yeah. Like maybe first what goes into what's the difference in reach? Because I think a lot of us think about, okay, if I'm going to try to hit the New York Times bestseller list or I'm going to try, like I need to pay a ton of attention to the platform, right? Like that's the most important thing. And it'd be easy to look at James's success and say, oh, it was the strength of his platform at launch that contributed to the success of the book. And I don't, I think that contributed to the initial, what now is a blip compared to the success of the book. It was a successful launch, but yeah, dive in. Well, so like James had a big platform, but he didn't have a bigger platform than Michelle Obama and he's crushing mm-hmm. Michelle Obama in sales. <laughs> right. okay? So like, this is the thing is like people try to just throw out like, well, he had a big platform or he, you know, he had, you know, famous friends that helped him promote the book. And it's like, yeah, but not bigger than Michelle Obama. Right. So it's like, you can't just do that. Um, you know, it's again, you know, I'm probably like one of the top in the world at book marketing and book launches please don't try to hire me. I don't really do it anymore. Um, (laughs) But um, when, if somebody would come to me and say, um, how do you sell a hundred thousand copies of your book? Like how can I launch my book and sell a hundred thousand copies? And the, the real answer is, I don't know. Like there's really no direct way unless you come to me with like a seven figure budget, I could probably pull it off. But for any kind of like normal book launch budget, there's no way to like sell a hundred thousand copies on purpose. But so that that's where the goal is in the across the industry. I'm not I'm far from the first one to say this. The goal is always like get the first 10,000 copies out into the world, get 10,000 people to just give the book a try because books only work by word of mouth. Like the only way you sell 100,000 copies is to sell 10,000 copies because you can't sell 20 copies and then hope your book actually gets out into the world. I think of it like launching a rocket into orbit. It's like it takes a whole lot of effort and, uh, and energy to get it into orbit. But then once it's in orbit, it's pretty easy to keep it going. And so um, if you get 10,000 out, then the book, you basically find out if your book's any good or not at that point, Mm -hmm. because I've worked with plenty of authors. We sell 10,000 copies and then nobody ever buys it again. And then you have somebody like James Clear, who probably on his launch sold, say, 50,000 copies. I have no idea. Yeah. 
So that's a great launch, but it's not the millions and millions and millions and millions of copies that have sold since. That's all word of mouth. In fact, most people listening on this podcast probably bought, has a copy of the book, first of all, but didn't buy it because they were on James list. They bought it because they saw it on 20 different podcasts or it was, they went to a bookstore and it was like lined in the front of the bookstore. And so, and the reason it was lined in the front of the bookstore was because it was selling so well, not because James did anything special to get it there. And so, um, that's the thing is like books only grow by word of mouth. And the other thing is they grow slowly because it's word of mouth. So like most, um, I uh, probably shouldn't share exactly who it is. Anyway, a book you've heard of, a nonfiction book you've heard of. I was talking to an author several years after the book came out and I was saying it takes a year for your marketing to really hit. Like it just, you just have to do it on faith for a year. And he's like, man, I am so glad you told me that. And again, this is a super best selling nonfiction book. He goes, I came out with the book. It launched really well. Um, had a really strong launch. He goes, and then for a year I was on every podcast. I was traveling, I was speaking and the sales just kept going down, going down, going down, going mm. down, going down. He goes and at the one year mark, it went like this. And then it just went up and never stopped. And you even described that with James book. Like it didn't become a multi-million dollar, you know, bestseller the first year. It was years after that. And it was because he kept pushing the book, kept pushing the book. And then it finally tipped over and then everybody knew it was like all of a sudden he was one of those like you know 10 year overnight successes yeah it's fascinating watching that and i've seen it a bunch of different times i was talking to dan martell uh with his book buy back your time uh-huh. and he he did the whole book launch uh he wrote a really good book and like he was doing the thing where you know, Hey, I'll come speak at your conference. If you buy a book for every attendee, right? He did all of the usual launch and promotion things, had a really solid platform and promoted it heavily. And the book did well. I don't know what, what list it hit at launch or that that sort of thing. But talking to him the other day, he was just saying, I learned that, well, so uh, Dan's a software guy. So he talks in terms of like virality and K factor and all that. And he's like, I learned that my book has a K factor for every one copy I get in the right person's hands. You know, someone who, uh, you know, is at a certain level in their business. Basically, if I get the book in the hands of, you know, an entrepreneur, then I know that like that results in another quarter of a book getting out to someone mm-hmm. else. Yeah. Right. Every book sold, you know, it has a K factor of 1.25 or something. And so once he realized that he's just been trying to get the book in as many people's hands as possible of yeah. actual readers, not, you know, warehouses, right, right, right. not, yeah, yeah. you know, you, you gotta have people read out. the book. Like it does, yeah. you can't, you just can't. And like when we were, um, we were promoting this book a few years ago, Sean and I, it's a 730 page fantasy novel. Right. Okay. And what Sean was saying was, um, it's easier to sell a copy of a book than get somebody to read it. And it was the, he's always said it, but it was the first time I realized like, okay, if I don't like fantasy novels and you're like, all right, you can read this 730 page novel or pay me $29, which would you pick? I'll like, I'll just pay you the $29. <laughs> yeah. I don't agree. Right. So it's like you, I don't really worry too much about book sales. I worry about getting people to read it. I will give a copy of a book, whether I'm promoting it or it's my own book or it's my pub, the book I'm published. I'll give a book to somebody if I think they'll read it because I don't need that sale. I need the sale of the next five people they tell. Right. And so, um, so that comes back to, I need to write a book that is so good that when somebody reads it, they'll tell five other people, because if I don't, It doesn't matter how many I sell on launch. It's just going to fall off a cliff. And it's like the amount of time and effort it takes to write a book. You might as well, if you're going to do something that's just going to fall off a cliff, you might as well launch another course because it'll make more money. If you're going to write a book, it's worth putting the time and effort in to make it something that people will tell five other people about. So it's easy to say something like, you know, we have to write a great book. And I think of it, you know, we're using the software example of K factor in software I don't know what factor means what is that oh, mean? so so k factor is uh, it's been a term in uh like virology for a long time of watching the study of um like communicable diseases basically okay. if someone gets 
uh, <laughs> this is a terrible example, but Ebola has a very high K factor, meaning okay. that for every person that is infected, a lot more people get infected. Okay, uh, I got you. In immediate contact. But the problem with Ebola is, problem, good thing, I don't know, is that it kills the host so quickly that right, right, right. it doesn't actually spread very much. Right, right, so, okay. Whereas COVID has a very high K factor, right? That's yeah, yeah, why yeah. we had a global pandemic. So, so it's basically a study of for every reader, how many more readers does that turn into? Right. Okay. Um, when we're talking book terms in software, you know, if you think of like um, something like Dropbox, when they had their refer a friend to get more storage thing years ago, yeah, yeah. that was a K factor play. And in software, we get to do something. Um, where we get to watch our users. We, you know, we've got great yeah. analytics. Uh, there's a tool we use at ConvertKit called Full Story, where I can uh -huh. actually turn it on and I can just watch as if we're screen sharing. I can watch someone use the software in real time and I could record yeah. thousands of sessions and then see, okay, someone went through the setup process. Oh, and looks like out of a thousand sessions, a hundred people got stuck right here. Oh, that's so interesting. But we yeah. can't do that in books. Yeah, well, see, that's it. Well, this this is what's crazy. I wish Amazon would do this. Is like they do know because of Kindle, so they know how far when people drop out of reading a book. And if I, as an author, could see my Kindle stats, I could go back and edit the book and fix places where people are dropping off. And so we want YouTube work. watch time, basically. For yeah, 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 yeah. And they have the stats. They have it because that's how you get paid with Kindle. And I won't go down that path. But like, yeah. Um, but that is also like you can do that anecdotally with books. Um, anyway, but yeah. I mean, it's easy to say write a great book, but it's hard to actually write a great book. And uh, I mean, this is what, you know, we pursue at StoryGrid is how to actually learn how to write a great book. Um but it really just starts with looking at masterworks, uh, which is books that you're like, if I could write a book like this, it would be a win for me. So it's like, if you want to write a book about um, self-help, it's like, you should be studying atomic habits and studying like, how long are the chapters? What are the titles? How, uh, how many words does he use that are more than three syllables? Uh, how long are his paragraphs? Um, you know, read it yourself. And when do you get bored? When do you get what, if you get done with the book, what were your three favorite parts? You know, like analyzing books and how they do. It. I mean, I remember I've done this for Ryan holiday books. Like I printed out the introductions of three of his books and I sat down, I'm like, okay, he changed subjects here, here, and here. So how long was each section? And I literally like counted the words and put the word figure. And then it's like looking at that kind of stuff and studying that kind of stuff of like, how do you structure a book that people actually read all the way to the end and leave a review on Amazon? And so um, those are the kind of things that you can do. Of it's Writing a book is one of those things that um, we all think we can do because we know how to like type sentences, but uh, writing a great book is the hardest thing I've ever set out to do. And so um, it's really fascinating to me um, how the whole process of how it goes, but yeah, taking the time to do something great is the difference again, between selling 10,000 and selling a hundred thousand or a million. It's just, uh, it's the, the, yeah. One thing that I'm wondering is how you really study those drop-off points. Cause like we're talking about, there's not good data or <laughs> the data exists, but it's not available to us. I was thinking of Years ago, there was a course called The Foundation, which was about creating a like bootstrapped small software company in a specific niche. And these two guys working on it, Andy Drish and Dane Maxwell, they knew that for the launch of this, they wanted like the absolute perfect video that would hook you. And so they wrote a bunch of scripts, they worked on it, and they were really working on the timing and everything else. And Dane and Andy were... Uh, in lived in different cities. And so what they would do is get on a zoom call together and Dane would have the script because he was the talent. He was going to record it. And Andy would go find someone else at the co-working space. He was at, he was like, Hey, can I run something by you really quick? And mm. they're like, yeah, sure. And you go, Hey, uh, my buddy Dane, like has, has a, a video he's working on. Like, would you mind watching it? 
and they would deliver it live. So it's like, here, put, uh, you know, if I'm doing that to you, I'm putting the laptop yeah. in front of you. And I'm sitting back and watching, right? So Andy's yeah, sitting yeah. back and watching as Dane's delivering the script. And, you know, we're totally just watching your reaction. At what point are you hooked and intrigued? What's the body language? At what point do you kind of look away or go like, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I got to, like, I was trying to do work, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they like tweaked and refined that script until they got it super, super dialed in. And when I saw the end result, it was one of those, you know, four minute videos that had me completely hooked all the way through. And what I want to know as a, as an author or a wannabe author is how do I do that for books, right? How do I get the book that is going to keep someone interested and have a big payoff? Yeah. I mean, this is what I do the entire YouTube series on. We have a three-year course on, or like uh, one Tim, on Tim, give me the 30 second Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like I had a friend one time that should know better that called me and was like, so give me like the secrets on how to write a novel. And I'm like, what? I don't know what you mean. He's like, well, just like, give me like the rundown real quick. I'm like, do just you understand? Thing, right? I've been working on this for years. You know, <laughs> like this is not something that like I could just. So it really comes down to understanding like so obviously you could do something like that with a book um you could definitely do that with like chapters um one of the things i tell readers all the time and i've actually done this myself where like um write a scene and just send it to six people and ask and just wait to see how many people want to know what happens next right okay. and that, we're, we're kind of leaning towards fiction when i'm talking about that yeah but i mean but it would work for nonfiction of like yeah. Like leave a hook at the end of like, here's what you're going to talk about next. Do not ask them for their feedback or anything else. Just send it to them and say, Hey, you know, let me know when you, when you give it a read and just do three of them, one of them, none of them, all six of them respond. And was like, well, what's, what's the next chapter? What happened? You know, now you've got them hooked, right? You know, they want to know the next thing. So send them the next chapter. And if they don't go back and work on your first one, right? And so well, this is like Andy Weir writing the Martian live on the internet where everybody yeah, starts following him. I mean, it's a little bit of a different example, but yeah. everybody following him is like, Hey, what's, where's the rest of it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know? Andy, that book, I, I could talk for, I, I've studied that book a lot that I love that book. I think it's so well done. Uh, his second book was atrocious. His third book, Hail Mary was really good. Um, the, um, Another guy that did this was one of my favorite authors, Max Berry, wrote The Machine Man um, one chapter at a time. And you could sign up for his email list and each day you would get a page of the book sent to you. And it was a way to force himself to write the first draft of the book. But he also got to see what parts worked and what parts didn't. Um, I think that you can, uh, if you're looking at the nonfiction, especially kind of health, how to self self-help space, this is where you can start looking at like, well, what are your most popular blog posts? What are your most popular YouTube, um, YouTube videos? Uh, when you are giving a speech, like what parts do people lean in and pay attention? Like those are the parts you need to lead with, with the book, um, front ending the book with the most compelling stuff. Um, but also like understanding how narrative works. So narr you know, value, uh, things have to change. You have to have an inciting incident all the way through a resolution. Um, you have to have a clear object of desire for your protagonist. And here's the kicker is that with how to self-help, the protagonist is the reader. That's why it's written in second person. So you have to think about your reader as the protagonist. So you have to incite your reader and then you have to build a progressive complication to make the problem worse and worse and worse and worse until you offer them a solution. And so, um, again, I've, I haven't looked at atomic habits, but I, and, and I've read it, but not analyzed it. I'm guarantee you this is in there over and over and over and over because it works. And mm -hmm. so it's learning again. This is where like, this is how Sean started my partners. You know, he's been uh, an editor for over 30 years. And actually we went back and checked recently because like less than 30% of books in traditional publishing turn a profit. And um, we went back and looked and his track record is 85%. And so he has, you know, he's two and a half times more successful than, you know, the, the publishing industry. And so, um, and how he learned what he knows is studying masterworks, um, and looking at books and books that work and have stood the test of time and looking at how they're structured, how they're written, 
um, you can, if you just take the time to do that, you learn so much and you start with the books that are like, I want to write a book like this, right? So my next fiction title comes out uh, this year. It's called The Shithead. And when I set out to write it, I wanted to write my version of The Accidental Tourist by Ann Tyler, which is this amazing novel. And so I read that book. I studied that book. I looked at the arc of that book, the structure of that book. Now, you would never read my book and be like, oh, he rewrote The Accidental Tourist. But it's structured in a very similar way. And whenever I got stuck with my book, I went back and said, well, how did Ann Tyler solve the problem in her book? And so um, I wish like so many people, the first thing they do when they're like, I want to write a book and they have this idea is they open up a Google Doc and they just start typing, you know, and they haven't really or they like make an outline, you know, but they don't compare their outline to other books and how other books have worked. Um, and so I think like that kind of stuff goes into um, writing a really great book and understanding it's going to be hard and take a long time but it the payoff is i mean enormous you know yeah oh and i mean what you can do with it is phenomenal something that you do with story grid and i want to get into the business of story grid and the flywheels in just a second but you take the most analytical approach to writing scene structure everything else that i've ever seen before yeah do you think that applies the same way in fiction as it does in or like can you apply that in nonfiction the same way that you've been doing it in fiction yeah and we have like we have a masterwork guide to the tipping point uh by malcolm gladwell um mm -hmm. we actually consider nonfiction downstream of fiction so it's actually a um an instant instantiation of fiction um but yes like the analytical approach is really important um like if you want to drive me insane, um, give the advice of like, hey, you got a book idea, just sit down and write it. And it's like, okay, that's like saying like, hey, your favorite song is Hotel California. Just pick up a guitar and play it. It's like, well, no. Well, why not? Oh, well, you have to know how to like play chords and and notes oh, and how to, how to tone a guitar and like how to like pick a guitar, you know, like how to strum. Like there's like to play the guitar is like, call it 20 different micro skills you have to learn and then put together and then you get to go be creative writing is the same way um and again just because you can write an email or a blog post doesn't mean that you can write a book like it's a completely different skill set and so um there are these like fundamental skills that you have to learn and that you can this is the thing too is it's not fucking subjective it is objective right so it is um I heard this great quote from Quentin Tarantino. I was, um, you know, w one of the interviews he did and he was talking about perfect movies and he's, and he started naming perfect movies and he's like, um, back to the future is a perfect movie. And what he means by perfect is not that everyone will like it, but if you like movies like back to the future, you will like back to the future. Right. And he mentioned uh, Texas chainsaw massacre. And he's like, that's a perfect movie. Now, most people probably won't like it. But if you like movies like that, you will like that movie. And so um, this is a thing is it's not luck and it's not random. There are just like um, playing the guitar. It's not random whether or not the chord progression works. Right. Like there is an actual clearly objective way that chords and notes have to be played. And if they aren't played that way. It, it's wrong. It's just wrong. And so writing a book is the same way. There are laws and principles of music theory. And if you yeah. break them without understanding them. That's the thing. You have to be so good that you can yeah. now break the rules, but you don't get to break the rules at the beginning because you break the wrong rules. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it just doesn't work. So applying that in books is the same way. I want to talk about the flywheel behind story grid because we did an episode I guess two episodes ago now about flywheels, introducing the concept, walking through uh, Sahil Bloom's flywheel and a bunch of them that we've implemented across ConvertKit. Um, so I, I think listeners are familiar with the concept now and you've got a flywheel for story grid that I think is just phenomenal. Like it, I understand how it all fits together. And then I think your audience, cause you did an episode on your YouTube channel explaining it 
your yeah. audience understands how it all fits together. So talk, talk through that. Like how, maybe let's just dive in that YouTube video that you did. It's titled yeah. the plot thickens inside story grids, evil master plan. And you have like sort of this like evil doom and gloom thumbnail for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Why would you, but in a world where most people are like, I'm going to put out content and then like over here, I'm going to have my true business model. You think I'm fully altruistic. Great. Let's keep that going. And then behind the scenes, you know, here's what I'm actually doing. And you don't share those normally, but you're out there and you're saying like, look, here's the whole thing. Here's, here's everything that I'm doing. Here's why. Uh, and here's like how I'm using your attention to make a bunch of money for decades to come <laughs> and just yeah, share yeah. the whole thing. Why do that? Yeah. So, I mean, this kind of comes from kind of two angles for me that I finally did that video. One is I kept getting questions from people like, why are you putting out the YouTube videos? Um, I would have phone calls with potential customers and they were kind of like skeptical about what we were doing. And, um, and everybody's real question was, all right, um, are you full of shit? And if so, you're like, where, where are you bullshitting me? Right. And, um, it may, so as I, as that was kind of royal, I got off a call with somebody that like, I'm, it is a legitimate question. Like you should assume everybody's full of shit until they prove you otherwise. So like, I am not offended that people assume I'm full of shit too. So, um, and so I got off a call where like, I, you know, somebody kind of came in with that attitude and, you know, we had a great conversation. It ended up great, but it made me think of Alex Hermosi, right? The big business he's blown up on YouTube and everywhere else now. Um, and for the longest time, I would not watch his videos because every time I saw him, I was like, that dude's going to try to sell me some cryptocurrency just by the way he looked. I was totally judging the book by the cover. And so, um, and then a good friend of mine was like, Hey, watch this video. It was a Alex Ramosi video. And I was like, all right, fine. Because you know, my buddy Matt told me to watch it. And then I watched it. I'm like, this is the best training on sales I've ever seen. And so I just, you know, nosedive into all his content. And what I really like about him is that he is super clear about what he's getting out of it. So one is he's like the bigger my platform. So he owns a company that acquires other companies, buys into them and then helps them 10 X or whatever. He's like, so the more people that know who I am, the more likely people will want to sell me their business instead of somebody else. Also, if I can teach you how to grow your business to the point where I can buy in, maybe you'll sell it to me or like, um, let me come in. And so I really like that. He's just super clear on like, here is the selfish reason why I'm putting all this content out. Yeah. He's basically saying, I want to help you build a great business yes. so that when you either want to double down and grow it further, or you want to exit, I'll be the first person you call. Right. Yep. So now he's getting first right of refusal on like hundreds and hundreds of companies. Mm -hmm. And so he's going to crush his competition because of that. Now, you know, he could also like start trying to sell cryptocurrency at some point. So who knows? <laughs> but like so far, he's like sticking to that. And so when I think about like what I'm doing, I think there are people that are truly being altruistic and just like they want to, you know, teach kids physics. And so they put videos up and they're a physics teacher and they have no back end to their business. But if you do have a back end, I think it's better to just tell the truth. So I just made the video and I'm like, look, here's how we make money. Um, our goal is to build a publishing house that publishes the greatest fiction ever written. Turns out that's really fucking hard to do. So um, when we tried to go about like taking manuscripts like other publishers, that wasn't working. So we realized um, we need writers that can do two things. One is write really well, um, but that's kind of a given. The other is let us kick the shit out of them when they do it wrong and they just keep coming back for more. Cause that's what I did. Like if, you know, we've been doing the podcast, we stopped doing the podcast, but we did it starting in 2015. There was over 200 episodes and it's just Sean kicking the shit out of me in my writing year like, on year. Here's why this scene sucks. Here's why. Yeah. This yeah. Yeah. Work. And do, so we were, and that's, and that's what we need is we need writers that will like stick with it. And so we started a writing program 
that's a three-year program that builds from how to write a great sentence because it is not a, it is not subjective it is objective how to write a great sentence all the way up to writing a full book over the span of three years i'm trying to put every creative writing mfa program out of business because our training is so much better and so, and it's all built on one-on-one -on -one feedback. So every week you turn in, you turn in your work and you get one-on-one -on -one feedback and you have to go try it again. And so, um, okay. So now we have a great training business training for writers. So at the end, they're writing books that hopefully they'll let us publish. All right, great. How do I get people to join a three-year program? Because people aren't just going to come off the streets. They've never heard of us, or maybe they read one of our books and they're like, well, you know, how do I know you're not full of shit? Cause you're expensive and it's three years. Okay. Well, we're going to join, we're going to start a six week workshop. All right. So this way people can get a little taste. They can come in and I can guarantee them. I can make them a better writer by the end of six weeks. And that is the guarantee. If they feel like they haven't, they can get their money back. So far, a hundred percent of students have said that they have. So it's a six week workshop, but it's also expensive. It's $1,200 right now to do a six week workshop. Cause again, they're getting one-on-one -on -one feedback every week. So how do I get people into that? That's why I do YouTube. And so I put out YouTube videos twice a week, um, teaching all the different aspects of writing based on Sean's research. It's all coming from Sean. He's the genius. I feel like I, I feel like I get to work with Einstein while he's coming up with the theory of relativity. So Sean has built an entire narrative theory from the ground up and I just teach aspects of it on YouTube. And that's the way I bring people in to get them on sales calls, so that they'll do the six week workshop so that they'll do the three year program so that they'll publish books with us. And like you said, the flywheel, what I look, what I get out of it is teaching the workshops and teaching the training. I don't do most of the teaching. I do some of it. I extract where people are struggling and the ideas they find most interesting. And that feeds into the topics that I put up on YouTube. What I like about that is, uh, well, there's this idea called the theory of constraints. Uh, which comes from a really great book called The Goal. Which um, I'm reading right now because you recommended it to me. <laughs> Look at that. And that yeah. book came out 45 yeah. years ago. 50, yeah, yeah. Like it's from the 70s, I think. Maybe the 80s. Oh, is it the 70s? Yeah, wow. Jeez. It's, it's not a recent book. Um, it's also a novel. It is. Yeah, is it's, fic it's a fiction book. Yeah. There's also, I don't know if I have it on the shelf. I don't know. Uh it's there's also a graphic novel version of it that the author's oh. son came out with uh, oh that's cool like you know 25 years later or something yeah. but in uh in the goal they talk about the theory of constraints and at a very high level it's you know they're talking about in manufacturing but it applies uh in many other areas and you look at the core bottleneck in the business and basically if you apply effort anywhere besides the current like most acute bottleneck, not only is that effort wasted, it actually makes the bottleneck worse. Yeah. And so when I think about what you're talking about, you're like, we're going to build a publishing house. Okay. Yeah. What's our bottleneck? Obviously great books. Yeah. And so if you were to spend time anywhere else, like maybe you're getting cover design absolutely dialed in, you've got printing and distribute, you know, all of this, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Like it just makes everything worse mm -hmm. when you don't have great books to publish. Yep. And so then you're thinking about, like, okay, what's the bottleneck to great books? Well, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. you need actually people, you, you need two key ingredients, people who know how to write books, and people yeah. who know how to edit books. Yeah. And so I love that you've actually split, you know, the program, you yeah. have two separate three-year programs on this, where you're saying, my core bottleneck is actually the humans that know how to do this thing. And yeah. so I'm going to create a machine that yep. is the best in the world at creating these two types of humans. And then yeah. I'm going to stick these two types of humans together and they together are going to solve my bottleneck, which will then get me, you know, a whole collection, right? We're aiming for what, for hundreds of books that will sell for decades. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the idea. And, and again, looking at Sean's track record, right? So let's say I pub every book I publish is two and a half times more likely than the typical book from traditional publishing to be successful, to make money. So that doesn't mean every single book we come out with is going to sell hundreds of thousands of copies. But if um, every book we come out with is selling 100 copies a month, 500 copies a month, 1000 copies a month, I mean, that shit adds up. And so it's like, 
it, we believe that again, the books that stand the test of time are the most well-written books. So we are putting all of our effort on, on helping writers and editors produce the best books possible. Um, and again, this is not an object, this is not a subjective matter measure. This is an objective measure. And so, um, so this is what we are focused on because we feel like if we can do that, then the publishing house will be successful because it's publishing much better fiction than the typical. I mean, I just read a book. I just finished it last night. And I was so frustrated. It came from traditional publishing, you know, was heralded as this book. I'm like, this book fucking sucks. Like, it's just not good. I'm never going to tell anybody about the book. You know what I mean? And it had clear problems that are fixable problems anyway. So like, this is what we're focused on. Um, well, it's like, I was it, talking to a friend who's a comedian and he said that conference talks are the most frustrating experience for him because he sits there in the audience and most great conference speakers tell stories. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so he sits there and he's listening to a story and he's like, Oh, this is good. Oh, this is good. And then they just like go somewhere else or they land it in the wrong spot or the timing is yeah, off. Yeah, and he was yeah. like, you were 95% of the way to getting yeah. like a great laugh from the audience and getting, keeping everyone engaged and all of that. And you just, you just screwed it up. And it's not like, you know, <laughs> like you're yeah, saying, it's yeah. not subjective. He's like, yeah, if you yeah. made right. these exact tweaks, right. then you yeah. would get these results. And he yeah. would do this where he'd help people with conference talks for a while. And he would actually track uh, his metric was laughs per minute of the conference talk. That's super and he went and helped Darmesh Shah, the CTO of HubSpot, give uh, his big keynote at the inbound conference. And they would have Darmesh, just like a comedian, would go test material you know, on a small stage. They would do that and they would track the laughs that Darmesh got. And then they would tweak each thing. And it was often just a couple words different or a little bit of a timing difference or something else. And they'd be like, there we go. That landed. And I imagine you doing the same thing. Well, here's, here's the thing, though. This is what's so interesting and is probably the most controversial thing that we talk about at story grid. I mean, controversial, it's not like it's politics or something, <laughs> but like what he's applying, what your friend is applying to Darmesh's talk can be tracked. Mm -hmm. Like you could graph it. Right. So we actually will take scenes. We can take scenes and graph the scenes on an actual line graph and find the boring spots and say, that's where a fix needs to happen. So it's like what he is applying is an objective measure that he is doing intuitively because he's picked it up over years and years of being a professional, what he does, he's applying it intuitively. This is how it works is he's like, he's watching a talk and he's waiting for air signals to ping the back of his brain. And he's going to be like, Oh, something was off. Now, sometimes he immediately knows. And sometimes he has to think about it. What's off, but he's applying a rubric to the talk that is a clear rubric. Now he's probably never written it down or if he has, I just know from experience of working with writers that do have a rubric, it's usually about like 50% there because so much of it they do intuitively that they don't understand the rubric they're applying. So like Neil Gaiman, Stephen King, these like great writers, um, they're applying very clear AB rubrics to their writing, but it's so intuitive, they don't understand them. Right. What we have done at StoryGrid is actually write that rubric down. And so when I evaluate a scene, I can immediately tell you what's wrong, where it's wrong and why it's wrong and how to make it better. And it doesn't matter if I like it because it's about the rubric, right? So like, that's what's so interesting about this stuff is it's like, you can take any talk apply the rubric and make it better because it is a, it is a rubric that applies across the thing. And it, again, it frees up creativity, right? Like the create, the creativity that he is, um, Dar is it Darmesh you said? Yep. He is experiencing in that talk is greater than just letting him do whatever he wants. Right. So, um, that's what I love about this stuff is that if you can learn it, you can like, you understand that by constraining down to a rubric, you actually create 
creativity that people enjoy. And so, and it's, again, it's objective. Yeah. Uh, there's so much stuff in there that that's really interesting to me. Going back to something earlier, I realized if we're talking about bottlenecks, you know, bottlenecks and flywheels, I think most people actually would misdiagnose the bottleneck in your business, right? Or in a, in a publishing house where uh -huh. they would say, the natural thing is to say a publishing house needs to be good at selling and marketing books, right? If we just sell more copies, then this is going to be more successful. And so they, the natural place to go that would be wrong is to say, we need to build a publishing house that's the best in the world at marketing books. And I think that's where a lot of businesses go wrong, where they're saying, okay, we need, how do we get our platform bigger? So that when an author comes to us, we have the biggest platform to be able to sell as many books as possible. And that's, they're zeroing in on a bottleneck, but I think they're, you know, that would be not understanding the physics of the book industry to realize that you shouldn't focus on that initial spike. You should focus on writing a great book. And then you ultimately had to build a completely different flywheel than what you would do if you had, you know, if you had believed that the bottleneck to selling copies was platform. Well, I, yeah, I could go different. I'm trying to, cause you're like, you're, you're just tempting me to just shit on the publishing industry. And I would <laughs> love to do that, but I don't think that would be helpful to your listeners. Yeah. On the business side, like, I mean, honestly, I, this is like such a common thing. I I've been listening to Alex Ramosi a lot. So he's the one that's most uh, like in my Top brain, but it's like, you just got to have a great product. Like mm -hmm. that is where all of the effort should be going at the beginning, because it's like the reason. So, um, well, I just closed a, a promotion because we, because we're running an MFA program, we only open twice a year because we've run two semesters a year and I just closed it and we just sold three times more spots than we've ever sold before. And I actually could have sold more. I just, we just don't have the, that's our current constraint is we only have so many one, people that can give one-on-one -on -one feedback and that's what I'm working on. But like, um, what we have hyper-focused on that I is why we're being successful is, um, actually making people better at writing. Mm -hmm. That is all I care about. Um, I let somebody go recently because they would not get on board with that vision. Right. I actually went back and looked at my budget from 2022 and, um, 82% of my, our income came from training and seminars only no feedback. And what we've realized is that doesn't make people better writers. They can pass a test about how a good story is structured, but they can't fucking write. Yep. So we move. And again, that fucks up my goal. I need people that can actually write books. So I don't care if you buy a training seminar, if that doesn't get you closer to my goal of you writing a book that we can publish. So now my 2024 budget. So over the last two years, I've changed now 81 point something percent of my current planned budget for 2024 is coming from one-on-one -on -one feedback because that is where people get better. I actually think it'll end up being more, but um, we've completely flipped the business model because that, and here's what's happening. People are telling other people. So one woman took my six week workshop. Not only did she sign up for the three-year program, she went and got two of her friends to take my next workshop and one of them signed up too. Right? So now we're talking about because the product is so good, that's all I'm focusing on. I'm pouring tons of money, effort into making the product as good as possible first. And yes, I'm doing YouTube to promote it, but it becomes way easier to promote something that is that everybody's talking about. And like one person was like, well, I want to talk to a couple of your students before I sign up. I'm like, that's fine. I'll give you the number of all of them if you want. All of them that allow me to give you your yeah. number. I don't care. Talk to all of them. Like our churn rate is almost zero. In fact, this semester it was negative because we had two people that had to drop out. One got injured and another had work stuff come back. So like we brought more people back than we lost this time around. And so it's like, the product is so good, therefore it's easier to sell it and everything else gets easier. So I think the biggest constraint for most people is like, like if you're, if you want to write a book on habits, can you write a better book than James? 
Like you, like, you, like that's what you should be asking yourself. Um, and so like you have, that should be the super focus. And like, I heard this for years and I didn't take it seriously. And, but it's like, if I could go back to any other time in my life, when I was focused on trying to build a business, I would be hyper-focused on just creating the best product I could possibly create, mm -hmm. whether it's a course or a service, you know, whatever it is, because then everything just gets so much easier. Um, and so anyway, yeah, that was, that was the thing that it's just getting so much easier because we have the best product that exists. One thing I'm curious about is how much does the, the work that you're doing of what you're teaching in the program, um, result like close the loop in the flywheel to the, the content that you're putting out, right? Like how often do you get the idea for the YouTube video from the day to day, you know, students going through, um, in the class? The, so I don't teach the three year program. So, um, I don't have a very up close view of them. Um, most of my stuff comes from, um, two sources. One is my sales calls. So that was a big change I made about six months ago too, is um, I stopped trying to close an email because our products are so expensive. So I just talk to everybody that wants to talk to me. And um, I keep feeling like, hey, I need to hand this off to salespeople, but I'm learning so much about my audience and their struggles from having these conversations. So a lot of it comes from the sales calls of like, oh, because are, we have clear solutions to problems, but they're super nerdy. And so like, it's, I have to, I have to find the path between what people are saying in their head and what they're struggling with and the solution. And so, uh, cause you can't, you know, nobody will listen to your solution if you haven't, if they're not convinced, you know, their problem. So I, t when I, um, get off the sales calls, I jot down notes or drop it in notion like, okay, here's, here's an idea for a YouTube channel is I got to solve this problem. And then I come up with like the story grid way to solve that problem, but I lead with the problem. So I come from that and I do teach, um, our six week workshops and, um, and I get a lot of, I get a lot of ideas from that too, of just like, I'm, I'm like looking at everybody's scenes. I'm like, oh, this is where people are struggling. And then I'm like, okay, I need to do a YouTube video on that. Um, could the other thing, I don't know how much this applies to everybody, but when we switch to one-on-one -on -one feedback, first of all, as far as I know, we're the only one that has a clear systematic rubric on how to give feedback from a sentence all the way up to a full novel. So our product is now feedback. So what that allows me to do is just teach everything we know for free. So like I, I'm trying to give away everything we know, because what will happen is people will go try to do it. They'll still suck and they'll need to come pay us to get feedback because writing is uniquely hard to do in a vacuum. You, it's really hard to self-evaluate your writing. You need feedback. And then when you ask your writer friends for feedback, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. So they say a bunch of random stuff that's not helpful. And so when you come to us, we are literally like, that's the problem. Here's how to fix it. Go try again. You try again. Okay. Well, that's better. Now this is actually the biggest problem. Fix that. Go try again. And that like short feedback loop is where people actually get better. So by focusing on that, it's like, it is open season. I'm putting everything we teach uh, in the workshops and the three-year program, it's all going on YouTube as fast as I can get it up there. That's really interesting. So in the last episode that I just recorded is with um, our mutual friends, Grant Baldwin and Brian Harris, and they both have inside sales teams for their businesses which I think most creators are probably like, wait, what? Hold on. That's, you know, and then you're over here saying like, yeah, I also do sales calls. And what I think is interesting is the flywheel that comes from that of put content on YouTube in order to get leads, book those leads onto calls, you know, close those, uh, you know, to, into customers. And we're going to use that revenue to drive everything. But especially those conversations you know, what questions people have, the way they phrase something like that is giving you just so much ammunition to say like this. Oh, okay. I, I did that video already, but let me go and redo it to this person, you yeah. know, and with that yeah. mindset, same yeah. content, 
totally different uh, target audience or mindset. And it's a totally new video. Well, and the other thing, and this is, this is really hard to keep in mind is I'm not trying to get a lot of views and subscribers on YouTube because ours, like, you know, let's say there's 10 million people that want to write a book. How many of them are going to pay $30,000 over three years to take our program, right? Like way less than 1%, right? I'm just looking for those people. So I am putting out, you have to understand, like, so if you think of signal and noise, right? So it's like, I always think of the old, like, radio dial, right? Like in my dad's old cut list when I was growing up. And it's like, shh, you know, you're like hearing the static and then you start to hear the voice and then you're like trying to like, like get it right where you hear the voice and no static, right? So YouTube is just static. I mean, as loud as it can possibly be. And I'm putting out this little tiny signal and I need to make sure the people that hear it are the people that are going to buy my my workshop set of $1,200 and my three-year program, which is $5,000 per six-month semester. So I have to dial my videos in that only people that are serious about learning writing, not people that are doing NaNoWriMo, people that actually want to get better at the craft of writing, hear my signal and then they come. So when I put out videos, I'm not trying to get videos that get a hundred thousand views because it'll, those are the wrong people. I'm trying to, I just need, I just, my, my goal of the program is 300 members. 300 like that's not that many but they're the right people and so um you so i have to like be careful about chasing the youtube stats because those are the wrong stats it's how many books how many calls am i booking and how many of those are leading to workshop sales and then to the writer mentorship and boom it's working we just 3 x our biggest sale ever and we ran out of space and mm-hmm. so that's the judge is like, so you have to be careful with these things that you're making sure you're judging it by the right metric. Because if I'm chasing YouTube views, that's a different metric um, than people signing up for my program. So I had 26 people sign up for my program. That was my three X 26. That's it. That's right. way less than a hundred thousand views on YouTube, but I made way more money off those 26 people than the hundred thousand views on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. When it goes back to just sharing that full master plan, right? Cause yeah. when someone realizes when the right person gets all the way through and they're like, what, what's Tim's deal? Why is he doing all of this? And you're like, wait a second, our incentives are a hundred percent aligned. Like <laughs> you're just, you're all the way down here saying, look, my goal is to publish a book that sells for decades. And as a viewer, I'm like, well, hold on. That's my goal. Yeah. My goal is to write and publish a book that yeah. sells for decades. Like, but it's oh. a di- this is the thing. So like I just, the video that went out today was for memoir writers. And the first thing I tell people in the video is your story is not interesting enough to be a book. Hmm. So if I was trying to get hundreds of thousands of memoir writers to love me, telling them their story <laughs> sucks from the beginning, your life is not that interesting is the wrong thing to say. But people that want to get the shit kicked out of them until they're a good writer <laughs> We'll be like, thank God somebody said that to me, right? <laughs> but that's like one out of a hundred or one out of a thousand right. people. So I don't care if a thousand people click on the video and right there, I lose 900 of them. It doesn't matter to me. I need that hundred that will watch all the way to the end and the one of those hundred that'll call me. And so, because, and thank me for telling them the truth. And so it's like, I am purposefully... I don't think I come across as a complete asshole, but I'm combative. (laughs) I'm like, I don't care what you feel. I don't care what you think. This is the truth. And so if you like what I'm saying over here, come over here. Cause I only need 300 of you. I only have room for 300 of you. And so it's like, um, so I think getting super clear on that kind of stuff is really important in making sure you understand who you're trying to attract and every signal that you're putting out. I know, I know we're going past an hour, but this is really important too. Yeah. So at the beginning of last year, our mutual friend Kara told me I needed to start talking to customers more. And so I have not stopped. That's why I still do all the sales calls. Is she's like, you have to talk to more people. You do not understand why people like you guys or don't like you guys or whatever. 
So I did 50 calls with people that some were customers, some weren't, some had joined the email list in the last week. Some had been around for nine years. Like it was all in between. And so, and here's what I noticed when I went back and looked at the notes, because I asked them all the same questions. Not one person said anything about making money off their books. Also, I talked to out of those 50, I think maybe five, I'd have to go back and look, were under 40 years old. Now, if you go to our website, it says, learn the skills, write a book, leave a legacy. Everybody, it's what's ha here's, here's my audience. They're getting later in life and they're realizing this dream they have, if they don't start now, is never going to happen. Mm -hmm. So their kids are getting older or they're about to retire. Or like I had one guy that's like his dad died at a young age and he's like, holy shit, I might die 20 years from now. I got to do this thing. And so nobody's trying to make a bunch of money as a writer in our program. We're very highly focused on fiction and it's like leave a legacy, right? That's why I wrote my, my novel. I mean, I hope it sells, but I got a job. I make money. I don't need it to sell. I want to leave something behind that matters. I did not realize that is why our audience loves us is because we do that. So mm. all of my marketing changed. I don't talk about trying to write a book that'll sell it a million copies. I don't talk about the marketing or the launching or anything. It's all about you have a message inside of you that you're trying to put on paper. And every time you try to put it on paper, it sucks and it's not very good. And you're not, it's not getting on the paper. It's like, yeah. I can see a picture in my head and then I go to paint it and it looks like a child finger painting it. Right. So it's like, we're going to teach you the skills so that that thing you see in your head, you're actually going to get down on paper. And, but I didn't know that until I talked to 50 people one-on-one -on -one, asked them all the same questions. That was probably about 70 hours of my time. Um, but like it, you know, that was the beginning seeds of what has turned our company completely mm -hmm. around. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. And, I mean, the customer research and, and just doing it in a hands-on way and, and using the words that people are actually using, like it'd be very easy in your headline to end with, and make money or and sell books yeah, or yeah. something like that. And that switch to leave a legacy is, you know, that's what that's the copywriting that comes from 50 hours of customer calls. Yeah. And and now I'm putting out a signal that's mm -hmm. attracting the right people. Of those 26 people that signed up, not a single one of them were under 40 years old. It's a mix, it's pretty even male, female. We had somebody join that was 70. So it's like and, and here's the, here's the real thing. Uh, that's what I think too. That's why I write, you know? Right. So like what I realize is like, oh, I'm already attracting people <laughs> that are just like me. I need to like lean even harder into it. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause when people are like, well, you know, nobody's going to make, you know, most of the people that take your program is not going to make that money back. I'm like, fuck you. Like, so everything you do has to have a price tag on it. Like I go to jujitsu four times a week. I spend thousands of dollars a year on jujitsu. I'm never going to make any money on that. It's like <laughs> the most useless skill. Like unless somebody attacks me that also knows jujitsu, it is a useless skill. And yet it means something to me and I'm getting something out of it that's important. And so it's like, understanding why your people do what they do too. Maybe your audience is they're trying to make money and that's perfectly fine. My audience is not those people. Mm -hmm. And so I have to lean even harder into that. And, um, and then they hear me above all the other noise of all the other people promising them they're going to put their book on Amazon and make a thousand dollars. Yeah. I mean, yeah, just that, that audience messaging fit. And then ultimately to the product, right? You have to have a product that, that delivers on that. But I think it's really fascinating to see all of the pieces come together and to see you play such a long-term game. Like I think so many people in this space, whether it's books or, uh, you know, podcasts or, you know, anything in the creator world, so many people are playing a short-term game. And so I love the way, I guess a couple things. I love the way that you're focused on decades, right? Your time yeah. horizon is like actually, you know, 20, 30, 40 plus years. Yeah. And then 
you're willing to put the blocks in place to make that happen. Like, I think most people would hit the bottom that can be like, we need great writers and editors and be like, well, that's not possible to do at scale in any meaningful timeline. And so never mind. let's go tackle a different problem. Well, and th- it's important to hear in the last year. Okay. So the last 14 months, November, 2022, I realized something was wrong with the business. Like something major was wrong. We did a promotion I thought was going to be our biggest promotion. It was one of our worst that, and now looking back, I'm like, oh, it's because we were relying on training and seminars. We need to switch to one-on-one feedback, but I didn't fucking know that at the time. I just knew something was wrong from November to August was the most suffering I've ever had in my business because I could not figure out what was wrong. It was just like slamming my head against the wall over and over. And I kept trying to do all the things I've been doing for years and years. You know, I'm 42. I've been in this business, whatever this business is that I do. I've been in this business a long time and it just wasn't working. And I kept just seeing our revenue go down in 2023. I got to take my full paycheck from my company three times. One month, I took a third of my paycheck. Wow. And so I kept having to work at it, work at it, work at it, work at it. And then it wasn't until August of this, of 2023, that I had the insight of what was wrong. That's in, you know, a bunch of shit came together where I could finally see it. Um, Personal stuff. And I mean, like, dude, like my marriage was like suffering this year. Like this was horrible. I was like, is this going to work? This whole thing may unravel on me. Um, like everything was falling apart. And then it was like, I finally had the insight and I had to push all of my, what chips, the chips that were slowly falling off the table, the ones that were left, I had to push into the middle. And so I made the change in the company. We're no longer selling seminars. We're no longer selling training which again, two years ago was 82% of our income. So (laughs) I started that in August and our revenue kept going down. Like it just kept going down as I was pushing all the chips towards January 7th, right? Mm -hmm. I was spending and I do all the editing, scripting, every shooting of YouTube myself. Um, I was, I, I, I added up one week. I was working roughly like 60 to 80 hours a week. It's like, there are no off days. Like I was getting up at 6 AM on Saturdays, working half the day on Saturday. I was working on Sundays. I was up at 6 AM every weekday, coming home, working at night, staying last night. I was up until 1230 editing a YouTube video so I could put it up today. And like the, the wheels were coming off. Right. Like literally in October, my partner and I were like, I don't know if this is going to work. Like we might end up having to let everybody go. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. And he's like, Hey, should we just do like one more training? I'm like, no, this is the right thing. And it's the right thing existentially. I can no longer sell products I know aren't making people better. And then it paid off. And so it's like, this is hard stuff that will change you. Like it will, like, I can't, I can't even like express the amount of suffering I've done over the last 14 months. And it's 14 months. Like this was not fast. Like I kept, I kept telling my friends, I'm like, I'm on a treadmill where somebody keeps reaching over and turning up the speed. And I'm like, this is as fast as I can run. And then they turn it up a little bit more. And it's like, um, and so like those 26 sales came in, we're set up for the year. We're going to be just fine. We're probably going to double our revenue this year. Like I'm actually going to get paid every month this year. Like all those things are wonderful. But like in July, I was talking to my wife. I'm like, I don't know if this is going to work. I may, (laughs) you know what I said to her? I said, you know, Nathan would probably give me a job. (laughs) Like, (laughs) <laughs> that's actually I what would. I said to her. I was like, if I called Nathan, he'd probably give me a job. We might have to move to Boise though. And uh, <laughs> now we're remote, <laughs> but uh, that's so funny. It just popped in my head, but I was like, I really, we had that conversation. Right. And then now I'm looking at like, Oh my God, we're going to double. And this is amazing. But it was not great there for again, a long time. Well, I think, I mean, what I hear in that is, the author that you were talking about early on in the episode 
who is doing all the activities that they know will work and they've got a great product and they're promoting it nonstop as sales are going down and down and down, but they're dead set. Like this is the right approach. They know that intuitively. And then, you know, you turn that corner and that's the same thing for ConvertKit, right? Of we had that, you know, two years in making $2,000 a month in revenue and watching the bank balance just decrease all the time and realizing like, look, it just takes making a great product and sticking with it for a long period of time. And so seeing that, you know, you always want that, <laughs> that inflection point to come before you truly run out of money. Yeah, But yeah, if you yeah. go to all of these different uh, creators, like many of them have, have a story like that of realizing like you have being certain on what you're going to deliver as a product and it not like, getting there as soon as you would like, or it taking this grind through the dip to be able to get there. Yeah. And, and I think the biggest thing that was surprising to me is that I was the problem. Like it wasn't some external thing like, Oh, I'm not doing the right things to grow the email list or, um, or, you know, whatever. It was like my entire, really the truth was, and this is going to be specific to each person, but for me, um, I was waiting on somebody to come and rescue me. Like I wanted somebody to come and tell me what I was doing wrong and tell me this. And I was like looking around and uh, it, I, through a series of events realized like, Oh, like I have to like take ownership of this in a way I never have. And I have to actually push all my chips onto the table. Like if this had failed, people would have lost their jobs. I would have to call Nathan and ask him for a job. Like everything would fail and it would be my fault that it failed mm -hmm. because I put all my chips on the wrong thing. But if I kept trying to like hold my chips back, they were just falling off the table and I was going to run out of money anyway. And so, but like, that was the biggest thing. Now I did a bunch of external things that turned it around but it took an internal shift in me and realizing like I have to change as a person and I have to become more brave, more, 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 more in all these areas that like honestly had held me back. I'm 42. I've been trying to do this for a long time and I have come to these inflection points and pulled back and gone and tried something else three or four times. And this was the first time I pushed all the way through to the other mm -hmm. side. And so, um, it's, it is not for the faint of heart. And then even like this is important because it's like making money, you know, like this is super important. And of course, of course it doesn't matter, right? Like fast forward a billion years, anything I do in my life doesn't matter. <laughs> so I have to do it for some other reason. So actually what I was most proud about on on Friday and Saturday when I finished closing all the sales and knowing like the business is not only going to be fine, it's going to be like, we're going to double this year. Um, I was like, the most thing I'm proud about is like, I am a different person. Like mm -hmm. that, that was like the best part of the whole thing was I overcame this thing that has been haunting me for decades. And right. so it's like, that is like, I'm like, I can walk around now, even if the company fails, at least I'm a different person, you know, uh, <laughs> and that is to me the most, like the most exciting part. And so it's like, I think looking at all of these things is not some sort of like success measure other than like, it will force you to overcome these demons that are like haunting you. And, um, that is the most exciting part of the writing process too, of all of these processes where you have to like push through these horrendous right. barriers. There's a couple of things I talk about entrepreneurship as, or, and setting goals as like to set a goal and to, to go on a journey. Let's see how to put it. I talk about entrepreneurship as setting a goal that is big enough that you're going to have to go on a journey that changes you as an individual right? You have to become a fundamentally different person. We don't have time now, but you know, we get into stories, like, right? If we read a, a fiction story and the, the hero is the same at the beginning and the end, right. like that's a terrible story, right? Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. it's garbage, toss it out. Yeah. And so I think about that of the difference between a lot of these, you know, maybe someone who hits it off with an audience or a viral video or a blog post or whatever, and gets to the point of, earning a full-time living 
versus the ones that push through and build something like really substantial. Really, I think the biggest difference is that personal change. And most people are going to hit that pain point. And because they've achieved a level of comfort in their creator business, they're going to back off from that pain point and say, never mind this $100,000, $300,000 a year, $500,000 a year that I'm making comfortably, I'm going to stick with that. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, if you want- Isn't there you know, though? Like, I hate that we say that. There is something wrong with that. Like, I do think there's something wrong with that. Like, sure, like people are allowed to do whatever they want and live their life however they want. That's fine. But like, I do think there's fundamentally something wrong with that, that you hit a point shine where, away you, from change. where you know you need to change and you back off. There is something unheroic about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Right. And there just is. And so it's like, yeah, you can live your life that way. That's totally fine. Nobody's going to come and like tear you down for that. But it's like, are you going to be okay with that? Are you going to be okay with consistently making the unheroic choice? Like, hmm. I'm not, you know, right. like, I, I mean, I'm like, for I'm, sure not either. I think I, like, I know I have a set of values and, and desires that I want to put into my own life and business and everything else. And I'm probably a little bit careful to not put those on other people, but I definitely like the number of times that I see someone else and I'm like, you have all the ingredients. And if you were willing to yeah. put in the effort and change, then you could have this major breakthrough. Well, and from my side of the table, it's like the amount of people that started businesses in the book industry because they wanted to be a writer and they've never written anything great, but they have a business. This is what I tell Sean all the time. I was like, I will burn our company to the ground before I will stop writing and pushing myself as a writer because that's how I started. And like, this is where like my next book, when I showed it, Sean had not read it until I had wrote the third draft of it. I showed it to him and he told me not only is this the best thing you've ever written? It's one of the best things I've ever read. And it's mm -hmm. like, if I, if that, like everything would be for naught. It doesn't matter how much money I've made on story grid, the business, if it doesn't produce what I set out to produce in the first place. Right. And that's what you're describing is like people set out on an adventure and then they get halfway there and somebody, and they like stop off on the side of the road and get comfortable. And then they just stop. And it's like, why? Like, it's so boring to stop. Mm -hmm. It's way more painful to keep going, but it's way more exciting. And so it's like, that is the thing. I'm like, I, I mean, I tell Sean this, I tell my wife this. I'm like, if I ever stop, just drag me out into the street and put me down. Like, there's just, <laughs> you know, it's just like, what's the point if like, you're just going to stop and coast? It's like, I'm here one time as far as I know. And so it's like, you know. I mean, I'm halfway done, you know? So it's like, right. do something meaningful with it, do something. And, and of course it's your values. Like and I just, and see, this is a thing is I can look at people like we've talked about Ryan holiday. I don't know Ryan holiday very well. He could, this could be his version of comfort or it could be his version of pushing constantly past his comfort zone. Only Ryan knows same for anybody successful. You've seen, you don't know right? You're the only one that knows my level of success is here, but internally I know when I'm being heroic and when I'm pulling back. And it's like, that's why you can't put your values on other people, but you know, when you lay down at night, am I doing, am I doing it or am I not doing it? That you know? that's a good place to wrap up. I like it. <laughs> you know, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Only, you know, and it can apply to yourself. Uh, where should people go to, let's say they're in that group of people. If they're just yeah. listening and they're like, oh, whatever, I don't want to become a better writer. Like, forget <laughs> it. Don't, don't look up any of Tim's stuff. But yeah, if they're in if that group of people like that resonates, where should they go to learn more about what you're up to? Check us out on YouTube. Uh, go to storygrid.com. If you go to storygrid.com and scroll down, I have like a little like mini blog post there. And at the bottom, you can schedule a time to talk with me. So if you want to get me on the phone for 30 minutes, I'm happy to talk to you. Um, but yeah, YouTube, storygrid.com, sign up for my email list, which runs on ConvertKit. Always. Uh, all of Help that me stuff. make some more money. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Good stuff, Tim. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Nathan.